Hey, good morning. Hey, so for everybody who survived Harry, uh, Harry Potter marathons from their roommates, I hope you're alive and well. Uh, yes, you have a question? Uh, yeah, you, I, hold on. I will be handing these back the next class period, so you will get them back immediately. Okay. I mean, is, it, is everybody turning in their assignment who's here? Okay, great. So uh, in that case, what well, we're going to be reviewing, uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with gray code, Parnall map, and race conditions, or anybody who's not familiar with those? Okay, good. So this, hopefully that will fly by. And then we're going to be going into the basics of computer architecture and computer organization. So we're building up these medium scale integrated circuits towards an actual computer architecture so that you're building these system attributes of the computer which contribute to their logical execution. And then the code that you write, you're able to write code that will be broken down and can be sent through the computer architecture. So that's the end goal. And at the time, end of time, we're going to be discussing computing performance, how you can actually change uh, certain aspects of that, of this computer architecture and the computer organization to make the computer run faster. Before I uh, begin, does anybody have any questions about uh, the material covered last class? Pretty straightforward? Okay, excellent. What the heck? <laughs> I've zoomed into 800. <laughs> All right. So here we are. OK, so basically, so here in this situation, we have a, a, what's known as a synchronous up counter. So the whole idea is you have a set of D flip flops, which some of you are familiar with. And they have a clock signal. The square wave clock, and this are what, these are what are known as positive edge triggered D flip flops. And the idea of, it, of these is that they only flip at the, at the positive edge, and the value is actually a one. So what's going on here is if it's a zero, it just holds like a memory element. That's the goal. And so every time the clock goes to one, it's supposed to increment. So if you have zero, 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 ideally. What you have is this value should go up and it becomes zero, zero, 001. So that's the whole idea of the counter. Now, there's an issue with these, is that sometimes you get this thing, these things called race conditions, which we're going to discuss today in class. Um, because of the way the clock works, it goes to all three at the same time. And you have instances where tra the transitions aren't always the same. So you won't get the, uh, if we're talking about the scenario, uh, the one I have here is 0, 1, 1. And ideally, we want to get to 1, 0, 0. But because of the way it works, it'll actually start out it'll, with the positive edge. It'll actually switch the middle one first to a 0. And then after that, because of the way the value is placed on it, it will then get 1, 0, 1. Yeah, I have the whole transition set here. I'll underline it. And then it goes to 1, 0, 1, and then finally flips the last bit to 1, 0, 0. Now, it, now, this is the key point here. If the output feeds into a sequential system, we were talking about last class, it can't quite tell whether this is the right value, this is the right value, or this is the right value. So... How do we? That's, this is what's known as a race condition. We have these switches where you don't you have intermediate values, and we try to minimize those. So, in a combinational system, you just get your input and you get your output immediately, so you don't have to worry about that. But in sequential elements, this becomes an issue. So one way this is done is done with this thing called gray code, and TGO 1.13. Is gray code is a set of continuous values in a circular list where the Hamming distance is one. Now, what we mean by Hamming distance is that it's the number of values that change in every single transition. So, for example, 
uh, in regular binary code, this transition, we're actually switching all three bits, right? So the Hamming distance is three. We have 0, 1, 1, and it goes to 1, 0, 0. So that's our worst case scenario that we're trying to account for. So what the gray code does is we have 0, 0, 1, 0, I'm sorry, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then if we go to 0, 1, 0, we're actually changing two bits. So instead of what we do is we flip the middle bit. And what's happening there is by only switching one bit, we avoid the scenario we were just talking about in the synchronous up counter. Oh, do I need to move up the uh, truth table? OK. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that I get it so that way everybody can still see the topical guide objective, which is at the top of the screen. I'll read it again for you guys. Gray code is a set of continuous values in a circular list where the Hamming distance is 1. So this is a 3-bit gray code. OK, so everybody should be able to see that. Is it easier to see if I move this table over the corner, or is it just because there's people in the front row? OK. Um, so here, instead of going to 0, 1, 0 for base 10, 2, we go to 0, 1, 1, because we're now only switching one bit. Same thing. Now we have 0, 1, 1 in the binary coding. We can just change the least significant bit to 0, 1, 0, and so forth. And so what I have below here, and you guys probably have learned this before since you're familiar with gray code, is this little trick of how to generate the gray code for any number of bits. So you construct a one-bit list to 0, 1, and then you reflect it. So you have 0, 1, 1, 0. And then you want to append the most significant bits like you normally would. Like, you know, when you're normally deriving binary, you have 0, 1, 0, 1, and then you have 0, 0, 1, 1 in front of it. So you want to append. So it becomes 0, 1, 1, 0. And then to add make it two bits, it becomes 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then you do the same thing. You reflect 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, and then you add the zeros and ones. So this is how we were able to derive the three-bit gray code. If you were to do the same thing, you could derive the four-bit gray code, five-bit gray code, six-bit gray code, and so forth. So therefore, you can come up with this circular list, and you see at the end of the three-bit gray code, by only switching the one to a zero, it comes back to the initial state. So that's how you're able to get the circular list, which is part of the definition. And it turns out the properties of gray code are very, very useful. We're going to be using them a lot in developing state machines, particularly with Carnot maps in a little bit. But I hope I've listed here a couple of other examples. Are you familiar with the Towers of Hanoi problem? The whole idea is you're trying to move these disks onto different uh, pipes, and you're trying to, you don't want to move more than one, and yet the goal is to get them all <coughs> on there. And using gray code, makes it uh, a lot more uh, simple to solve the powers of Honoi problem. And genetic algorithms, because of these incremental changes in the ways that the, uh, the actual, uh, the, uh, all of the, um, the elements in, in the G GCAT, the, how they change, using gray code, you can use those to map those more efficiently. So even though those binary values aren't a one or a two, they still reflect the same numerical value? Correct. Okay. So they're, they're unique. So the whole idea of any binary machine language is you want some sort of unique binary value to represent. So you're never going to get 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1, 1 here. So here, 0, 1, 0 is always going to re reflect 3. And then here, for 5, you're, for 6, 1, 1, 1 is always going to reflect 6. So as long as it's unique, it does reflect the binary value. Any other questions? Okay, so gray code are used in these things called Carnot maps, which uh, are commonly refused, refused, um, referred to as K-maps. And they are a pictorial method used to minimize Boolean expressions without having to use Boolean algebra theorems and equation manipulation. So uh, we're not really going to go into using uh, Quine-Mikulski reduction in this course. Um, 
but we are going to be using KMAPs a lot. The types of questions that we produce on an exam, we would be using, we would be using KMAPs. And KMAPs use this gray code, and the reason why is because, and I'll go this to this a little bit, is that you're able to see race conditions in sequential elements. And by using, by making sure that the uh, overlapping elements within the KMAP are not disjoint, we can reduce these, we, we can eliminate these race conditions and ensure that the value that we're sending out to the sequential state machine is correct every time. And so, the next value here, we're going to discuss the difference between a min term and a max term. A min term is the instance of the function where the output is 1. And it's shown symbolically as the function is the sigma of mi. And uppercase mi is going to be the max term here. So basically, if you have an AND gate, this is a simple version. So you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then the outputs are 0, 0, 0, and 1. This is your min term. That's a simple version. And then all of these are max terms. So the summation of it would just be um, equals 3, because 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then it would be 0, 1, and 2. And then you can use that to actually derive the AND function in a very simple uh, Carnot map. And so the max term is an instance of the function where the output is 0. It is shown symbolically in this manner. And I had a, a guy from Moses who actually, uh, when I asked him like things that uh, students in interviews don't know, he actually went on this huge five-minute rant about the number of times he asked students what min terms and max terms are K maps, and they have no clue. So that's why it's a TGO. I know it's a review, but there's times like, yeah, maybe I should do that if I if industry people are ranting about people not knowing it, right? So. Uh, so, but you guys understand the general idea of min terms and max terms? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so here's an example. <laughs> so this is a, fun, a you know three input one output function. And so we have three values of one. Four, I'm sorry, four values that are one. Uh, zero, zero, one. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So the min terms are derived as 3, 5, 6, and 7. And so, see here we've built it up. The min terms are 3, 5, 6, and 7. And by default, because we don't have any don't pairs in this, all of our max terms are become the remainder. So it's 0, 1, 2, and 4. And so building the K-map, This is the actual Carnot map itself here. And the idea is, what I've done is you can see here, we have you can split these in any way you like. So here you have A, B, and C. A is this column going down, and B, C is the column going across. And we count this way 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0 using that gray code. And so what you're able to do, as it show kind of down here in the example, you can actually try to find ways in which they overlap, where all the min terms overlap. And based on that, you can actually derive a function that can serve as your circuit. So in the example I gave here, uh, a not B C are true. These two got these two and these two, right? And so these are these are true always when B C is one one. 
it, this is true when uh, it's a b just these two for the green and for yellow it's a c and if we were to do the Carnot map uh, like this where I circled these two and made sure they weren't uh, disjoint this could be uh, B C sorry it writes a little slow or A B or C so this would be if you did the Carnot map in this manner and the reason why it's B or C here is because it's an instance where it's always true if either value is one so you're able to look at it that way and then from there derive a circuit yes we did originally we could only do uh, like two four eight so we can do three if we make it uh, logically if it's yeah this is a valid car on map yeah it would be weird if you did what's that we never learned it like that Okay, well, you're learning it like it now. <laughs> so wait, so if you, you can only use 2, 4, meaning that uh, you did a Carnot map, and you can only have 2, 4, 8, and 16 inputs. For the, the grouping. For the, for the grouping. is a bigger map. Right, well, I mean, we're going to go into bigger maps, of course, but, you know, you can still derive a function this way. Right? Hmm. Um, hmm, that's weird. Okay, well. Well, this here's an example that will make you feel a lot more comfortable then. <laughs> but this is, a, I mean, this is, a, this is a classic. This is actually an example. I mean, I, I take a lot of these examples from the actual papers themselves. So Carnot used this K map. So he says it's okay. Okay, so here's example question 1.3. In the example question, if I were to give this on an exam, I'd phrase it just like this, where I will give you the min terms and the max terms, and then you will derive the k-map and come up with the uh, function. So in this case, a, b, and c, d, make sure that you use gray code. And then here it's 0, 2, 4, 5, 8, 10, and 12. So 0, 2, and so this becomes 1, 0, 4, 5, 1, 1, is it 1, 0, 0, 0, 8, and this is 10, and this becomes 12. And then here, I specifically uh, did this way. So the red box goes around all the C, D is 0, 0. The blue box goes around A, A B, 0, 1. So this becomes A is 0 and C is 0. So A, B, 0, 1, C is 0. So that's how that comes out. And I did the, why do you think I did the green parts so that came up that way? Yeah, they're locked, yeah, they're locking around and you want to make sure that, um, uh, you want to make sure that they, you get all the parts of the came up. Okay. And then from there, I indicate that the function for green is a not d not b uh, a not b not d not. So you can see here, a not b not, and then d not is these two, or a b not d not. Right. So that reduces to b not and d not. And then red is just C not D not because this is these. And then blue is A not B not C not. So then you can use those to come up with your final solution, which is this. Yes? Mm -hmm. Um, when I, if I give a question like this on an exam, um, it will be part of a 
bigger question, which we'll be getting to a little later. Um, but if you, let's see, that's a good question. Um, I suppose in the interest, if you're able to successfully identify, you're, the next thing we're going to be going over is race conditions, and I'm going to be going over the difference between what I want you to account for race conditions and what I don't, which is basically going to be a sequential element or a combinational element. The combinational elements, I just want the smallest element possible, whereas with sequential elements, which I kind of did here, you, you would want them to be uh, accounted for. So if you can correctly derive the K-map, uh, I'm not going to answer the question. So you can derive the K-map and come up with an equation. That's fine. Okay, so here, uh, TGO, oh, so does, does everybody uh, understand this before we move on? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so the left column going down, that's A, B. And yeah. then A not, B not. And then it's. Yeah, it's A not, B not. Oh, is this, I'm sorry, C not, B not. Oh, okay. because of C, D. And so all of the instances of C not, B not are taken up, so that's why that's part of the equation. We're here, um, and I have these wrapped around so that way, which we, we're, I'll be going over this next, so, uh, but the whole idea is we want to make sure that in the instance of avoiding race conditions, they are not, they are not disjoint, meaning that if I only had these two, and they wouldn't be connected to these at all, then that's known as a disjoint graph. All right. Does anybody, does anybody not know what I mean by disjoint? Okay, the idea behind disjoint is, let's say I did this. Let's say I did this map. And then I did these, this, and that. As, so you could use those to derive a function and then use Quine Mikulski to come up with a reduced a function. But this joint means that they're not overlapping, meaning that they're not joined together, they are disjoint. And what happens, the property of it being disjoint. And I can actually scroll down to the whole uh, race conditions and disjoint to explain this a little more. Now, race conditions are like what we described at the beginning of class, where you have those flipping and the ones and zeros and an up counter. Since asynchronous circuits do not have discrete timing signals to regulate circuit operation, eliminating race conditions is a very important concern. So what happens here is this in this problem here, let me. I'm going to scroll up and then I'll scroll back down, I promise. Um, this is a disjoint graph. If we extended this, this blue circle over, then all three of them are going to be connected. And then they're joined together. So it's, this is an instance where you would have a rate condition. So I'm going to scroll back up just a little and then go over the definition of race condition. A race condition is the behavior of electronic or software system where the output is dependent on the sequence or timing of other uncontrollable events. So the instance of the uncontrollable event at the beginning of the class is the up counter having to switch from 0, 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0, and we had bad timing on the outputs. <laughs> And I've kind of bolded. Bearing this in mind will save you lots of time in coding projects in this course and in your career. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is that you say you're designing a counter and you haven't accounted for race conditions. Well, you're going to get weird outputs propagated further on into your circuit and you're going to have a hard time troubleshooting. It's like, wait a minute, why does this ALU give me bad outputs? Well, it's because of some synchronous circuit that you didn't properly account for race conditions. Yes. The, so you're saying that when they're disjointed, we we keep them separate from each other. And it helps to eliminate the race. No, no. You, if they're disjoint, then you cannot guarantee that there are no race conditions. Okay. How, how do you so, TGO is one point seventeen because this is answering your question. Race hazards are easy to spot using a Carnot map because a race condition may exist 
when moving any pair of adjacent but disjoint regions circumcised on the map. Meaning that if there, are, if there is a region that does not connect to any other region, there may be a race condition. Whereas if you were to connect them, then the race condition can be guaranteed to not exist. Does that make sense? So they're easy to spot on the Carnal map. And so, I, so here, we spot them on the Carnal map. There it is. <laughs> now, I can get rid of this in one of two ways. I could extend this here. Or I can do another one here. Or I could even do, or I even can extend the red one so that way those are taken up. So there's multiple ways that you can look at it. And if you're in the instance of trying to re, you know, in the case of trying to reduce the size of the circuit, then you have to account for all of those. Okay, does that answer your question about race conditions? So we're on that, it's really easy to take. Yes. So is it easier to do the larger or the smaller, the shorter regions? It depends. It really depends on, uh, they, uh, ultimately, in this case, it's easier to just move it over. Um, in this case, if you were to move this up, then what happens is now all the instances of A are covered, so instead of A, instead of except for C and D1 would not be covered by that. But this could, could potentially cover almost all of your um, uh, bin terms. And we're going to be going in, in here a little bit about uh, what happens. You're trying to cover as many as possible. And what happens if you have an instance where uh, a region is uniquely covering one of the elements. OK, so these are. Um, is we're going to be going into prime implicants and essential prime implicants in a little bit here. So that'll, that'll go answer your detail, answer your question in more detail. Any other questions? Okay, so did everybody understand 1.16 and 1.17? So example question 1.4, given the following Carnal map, find any race conditions, describe how they may be eliminated by drawing the updated K map, eliminating the hazards, and stating the updated function. So I've given you this K map. So I've essentially probably solved it for you by answering your questions, but I've kind of I've taken the liberty here. A C not, A B not, and blue is B C B not. Therefore, the original equation is just a combination of all of those three, AC naught, AB naught, or BCD naught. <laughs> However, there exists two race condition hazards since the blue region is disjoint and adjacent to the red and, uh, sorry, to the red and green region, right? So you could extend that region to join with the green K map, which is the green region. Now it's no longer a race condition. You could extend the red one. As long as you show your work, it's. Let me uh, scroll down. I don't. On an exam, I wouldn't expect you to go into this much detail. Like I, I'm going into this much detail specifically to show you every step I went on in my head. Um, so here, I have an example of where I've extended the red. We're going to move state 1110 and move 0101. The output is meant to remain at 1. Right? However, due to the underlying circuit implementation, it may be possible to. Oh, yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm describing what the race condition is here. It may be possible at the instance where we're switching from here to here in the previous K map. If you're switching, then this goes into more detail in your question. If you're switching, if there's a disjoint, if you're trying to switch out of a disjoint region into another region, that's where the race condition may occur. So the race conditions may occur when you're switching from here to here, if you're going from this region to that region, or if you're going from this region to that region. Does that make sense? So that's where your race conditions may occur.
And so uh, here I show the solution by doing this. So on a, I, an exam type question, what I would expect you to say is this. And what and so you can reduce the number amount of writing on your example question, just say here's the state the uh, two places where the where there could potentially be a race condition. State to be from one one I'm sorry, yeah, one 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 zero, that's how I described it, to one zero one zero, that's a potential race condition. <clears throat> and then from one 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 zero to one one zero zero is the other potential race condition. And then part three is update KMAP. So the question I have a phrase is find any race conditions, describe how they may be eliminated. So that finding the race conditions means state which ones they are, and then update the K map in that manner. And then the last part is state the new equation. So you can update the equation in that way. And I've taken the liberty of reducing it for you. But as long as you actually correctly state what the equations are, you should be fine. Does anybody have any questions about that? So if they can all be connected, we need to, we need to try and make Yeah, if I specifically say, and if I specifically say it's a sequential element or race conditions need to be avoided in the problem, and I'll, I'll have two examples of questions later where I will show, show you the difference in how I phrase the question. Yes? So just part of this example, you extended the red to mm -hmm. wrap around, but you said it might be easier to extend the blue. It might. That. Yeah, that would be a that would be a correct answer on an example. Yeah. That's why up uh, I should say this may be fixed right here. So if you're looking at this on the video later, I phrase this may. It, a lot of times there's not one just one correct answer. Sometimes you have to. There's this is a good example where there's multiple correct answers. As long as they're no longer disjoint, then you have a correct rate where the circuit has prevented the race condition. Any other questions? Oh, you know what? I have, let's see. So here I'm comparing, I should make it a little note here. This is not, you don't have to put this in the answer, but I've compared and contrasted the two results. So here, this is a reduced version of the previous K map. And here is a here is the function for the updated K map. Now they're logically equivalent. They'll give you the exact same min terms and max terms. However, you have to you'll have more circuitry which will be used to ensure that the um, update uh, the race conditions are prevented. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably should ask. Does anybody have any more questions about that before I move on? Yes. You're doing one that's not uh, the, like the three or the, the five or six. Or is there any difference in, in making one like that, like a, a primary skip to those, as it would be just one of two or four or anything like that? No, it, it's it's really no different. Sometimes you just have uh, an instance where you have uh, two on one column and one on the other. And the, you still have to use gray code. So for example, if you were doing uh, eight and four, you would use the eight bit gray code on one side and four bit gray code on the other. But it, it, would, it still works. It definitely works. And uh, it was especially later when, in the uh, course when we we're going into how to design various uh, flip flops and how to use those to actually design sequential state machines. Those are very, actually very common because you're going to have the four. Let's say you do four four state uh, four state machine, and you have to have the edges. You can only represent that with uh, one variable because you're representing the binary value to change between the uh, states. And this would be section four, so you'll learn way more than you probably want to about this later. But you will need to be able to do K maps to do that. Hey, any other questions? Okay, good. Okay, so um, in this course, 
we're going to be building up towards this thing called MIPS, which I've kind of alluded to a couple of times. It's called a microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. It's an example of a digital computing system architecture that we're going to study here. And I've listed the objectives five, six, and seven that I expect you to be able to meet in this course. And a lot of this kind of goes into uh, knowing the architecture of a computer system, knowing how to transfer information between the arithmetic, logic unit, memory, the registers, the data path, and we're going to touch on memory hierarchy and virtual memory design towards the end of the course. And objective seven, knowing the relationship between the hardware architecture and the assembly language instruction set. So you have your code. Um, let me ask you this question. How many of you have not coded in C before? Okay, so for this course, um, I, I was brought to my attention yesterday, and there might be some of you who haven't. Um, basically, we're going to be going over very, very simple code snipp snippets of C. Uh, have any have all of you coded in Java? Is there anybody here? Okay, so the more people have been coded in Java. All right, so I'm going to do very simple examples of C code. And the idea is you should be able to know, did, how many of you know what a, do not know what an array is? Okay, so everybody knows what an array is. So you, I will say this is an array, this is an integer, and we're going to be relating. I'm not expecting you to be masters of C in this course. So just, I'm just trying to make sure that what I've, uh, the course I've prepared is, uh, I'm not going way too over your head. Um, and if there's any instance when we go over C code later and you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, feel free to come to my office hours, talk to me. I'll be more than happy to walk you through it. Okay, so here's the general idea of, of a computer hardware. You have data path and control. So the data path is kind of, you can think of that as your combinational element where you're going to be doing as, all of this, um, all of these interfaces. So you have your memory here that's being used to feed the data path. And you have the user gets puts in input, and eventually the user is going to get an output, right? So what's going to happen is the mem you're going to get an instruction, and part of that instruction is going to say, here's the control, this is what the instruction is supposed to do. So based on the particular control, it's going to turn on certain parts of the data path, turn off other parts of the data path, or manipulate the data path in certain ways that are visible to the programmer in order to produce an output or update the memory. So you can think of this as your from the digital system definition from last class, where you have your inputs, you have your processing element, and you either have your state element or your outputs. So the hardware architecture is meant to mimic the, de the uh, digital system. And specifically, um, TGR 1.18 is what is an instruction set architecture? Instruction set architecture is a set of assembly language instructions that provide a link between hardware and software. And that's, so the whole point is you want to be able to keep your people, your code monkeys, or your computer scientists, and your computer engineers, and your electrical rig engineer, give them a set of things that are supposed to meet, and they can work separately. They don't have to constantly check with each other. So your your guys are doing hardware. You guys are electrical engineers. You want to be able to design the most efficient performing digital system that meets the instruction set architecture. And then the computer scientists, the ones who are much more familiar with C, will design the compiler, which drives the micro engine, which, the, the bot, which then uh, derives down to the assembly language and the machine language. And that's where you meet, is right here at the instruction set architecture. <laughs> ah, OK, so um, here's another industry expert quote. Uh, it's a guy named Henry Petrosky who has written a prominent book, Engineering is Human, the Role of Failure in Successful Design. And he said, the most amazing achievement of computer software industry is its continuing cancellation of the steady and staggering gains made by computer hardware industry. So the reason why uh, I include this quote and the reason why it's important to understand computer architecture, instruction set architectures, and all of this building towards from the advanced digital systems up to this is because you need to be able to 
in order to produce a computer that has high performance and has high uh, speed execution of compiled code, both the computer hardware and the computer software engineers need to be on the same page, and this is how it's done. If you're not, especially if you're dealing with Java Virtual Machine, which is supposed to compile to any instruction set architecture, that's the goal of it, then you start getting significantly slower performance. Okay, so I've kind of already talked about these already. So instruction set architecture is designed to extract the most performance out of available hardware technology. So basically, let's say I'm, a, I'm your customer and I want to build a certain type of computer. And you're like, all right, hey, I, we can do this because it's very fast, high performance. And you go into this whole thing, he says, whoa, whoa, that's cost me way too much. There's no way in heck I'm paying for that. Now you have to make good design requires good compromises. So now you're trying to reduce the size of, of the chip, but still be able to maintain this high performance. And you have to, and these are the kinds of things you have to worry about. And hardware mm -hmm. reuse and being able to make the most efficient use of the, uh, making the common case fast, so to speak, is going to be a very important point in, in design. And so uh, I've listed here uh, some examples of instruction set architectures, which I'll abbreviate as ISA. Risk which is what we're going to be learning in this course. Reduced instruction set computer. Probably enjoy the fact that it's reduced. Um, so that, but the whole idea is you're trying to make, take a smaller set of instructions and perform the exact same uh, code, which means you're going to do a lot of hardware reuse, a lot of code, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of instances of register reuse and so forth. Complex instruction set computers, we're going to be uh, studying briefly here, but the whole idea is that you can actually build uh, floating point elements, floating point arithmetic logic units, regular arithmetic logic units, and try to execute multiple instructions simultaneously within the same data path. Um, but it requires significantly more hardware overhead, but it can go a lot faster. So there's trade-offs. And very large instruction work, VLIW, is what happens when you're trying to make instructions that can account for up to 128 bits. The data path that we're going to be studying with the reduced instruction set computer for MEPS is 32 bits, and every instruction is 32 bits. In yeah. complex, I'm sorry? Very large word. Very it's very word. large instruction word. And complex instructions can have varying lengths of instructions, which makes it even, which makes the controller um, more complicated. So when we get later on the course, we start talking about things like pipelining and data hazards. You're going to see that every time we incorporate something to try to make the computer go faster, it requires a trade-off. Pipelining, we can have up to five instructions in the same next data path at once. Now you have to worry about data structural and control hazards requires more control, excuse me, more control hardware. So, but we'll go into that more in section uh, five than section six. But for now. The important thing to know is that assembly language is a symbolic representation of machine instructions, PGO 1.19, and machine language is a binary representation of machine instructions. So how many of you have actually dealt with assembly language? Like five or six of you. Okay, so I'm going to screw up just a little bit. You should still be able to read the definition. But basically, let's say I have a very basic... <laughs> some B6 C code. Let's say I say A equals, sorry, it's taking so B plus C and then add the semicolon. So how do I get from this C code down to translating it to binary? So the assembly language instruction, which is the symbolic representation, is going to be the symbolic representation of how it's going through the hardware. So this is an add instruction, and then S2, these are dollar signs, dollar sign S2, dollar sign S1, dollar sign S3. And what the symbolic representation means is I'm taking the values that are stored in these two registers, S1 and S3. In this case, the compiler will say, I want to store the values of B and C into those registers, and then I'm going to add them in the arithmetic logic unit and then store them in this register, which is S2. So that is the symbolic representation of the instruction. Now the binary value of the instruction 
these first six bits here, this 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that is what's sent to the controller. It says, all right, this is the specific instruction that I want to do. Now go and do it. The next five bits, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, I mean, you'll learn this more, but that's the actual register representation of S2. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and the next five represent the two values we're adding and storing into the registers. And then shift amount, which we're going to be going into much more detail later. We're not shifting at all, so it's all zeros. And then these last five bits are known as the function, and we're, we're going to be going into much more detail. But the, the whole idea is now we've taken some code, we've broken it down symbolically, and now we actually have a binary value that once we get into the data path of our digital system will actually execute instruction. Yes, so to clarify, you've got pre uh, stored information for S1, S3. Yes. Right. Right. When we, when I, um, down here, when I talk about MIPS in a little more detail, um, I'm going to be I'm going into the idea that MIPS is a compiler driven encoding of the micro engine. And what that means is the compiler is going to load all of the information that's pre. So if you have C and you're, uh, say, you were say D equals one, C equals five, and you initiate all your variables at the beginning of the program, the compiler will store those values into the registers or the data memory. And then based on that, at, when this instruction occurs, what happens is either it's been put in there by the compiler or a previous instruction correctly calculated the values of S1 and S3, at which point we can now put those into the arithmetic logic unit, get a 32-bit result, and then store it in this other register. Later in the, okay, so I'm going to do uh, something that I happened in nuclear power school quite a bit when we would get to a, a concept that people kind of were like, oh, and I was like, no, we're going to go into much more detail and you'll understand eventually. I'm just giving you a, a taste. They would draw this big circle and write, I believe, and is the I believe button. And it's not working right now. But let's say I believe. And right now, you will know about this much more detail by the end of the course. But right now, just, I believe. I believe, Dr. Morrison. I believe. So, I mean, at this point, I'm not going to be asking you this kind of stuff on an exam. But I do want to give you an example of the difference between assembly language and machine language. And... I do mention here that uh, objective seven is understanding the relationship between the hardware architecture and a computer's assembly language. So the whole idea is how does the designed digital system, the advanced digital system, translate this into something that actually does what you want it to do? That's the objective. We're going to get from, oh my gosh, what are all these zeros and ones mean to you understanding and being able to design a system that does that. that is, that's my objective anyway. Oh. Okay, so what I did, I've actually posted this code under content and reference files. So for those of you who are familiar with C um, or know what C compiling is, um, you can actually play with it and see what happens. So you have matmul2.c is a matrix multiplier which can multiply matrices of 100 by 100 together. And what I did is I've done these two compiler line uh, the whole, I'm sorry, the uh, command line instructions. And the whole idea is that this actually generates the assembly language and eventually generates the machine language. So the code here generates your assembly language. So it actually takes that code that I posted there and tells you, based on the specific compiler, and the, the, I should make a note, the very last line here is, we'll say, GNU 3.4.6. That is the actual compiler that's driving the encoding of the mic. I'll get to your question in a second. Okay. So these are going to be different based on your different uh, compiler. But the idea, and the reason I'm showing this to you is, guys, I want to give you, you have some code, and it's actually saying what's actually going on in the data path. So as an example, 
here, SP means stack pointer. Stack pointer points to the place in the stack where your code is, where the instructions that you want to execute are. So first instruction says, move down 112 bits, and that is where your code begins. You don't want to be executing code above that, because that's, that's not your code. That's other things. Um, if you ever decide to take a software security course, that's actually what's known. By, by making, if you can uh, upload a virus that changes this number, it'll actually do something called a stack smash or a stack overflow and actually screw up all the rest of your code. But in the meantime, and I really hope I'm not overwhelming you, general idea is here's where you start and then move 100 into this register and it's putting values into this. So 100, remember I told you, what's that? Oh, uh, doing stuff like this, kind of a friend of mine wiped the entire card around. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I did it, and I'm just showing you on the screen. Wait. But, I mean, I, and I posted all the results, so you don't even have to worry about running the code, you can actually look in there and see. You can just, I've downloaded it and put it on Blackboard already for you. Um, but move 01 and 0 is 100, now I told you that the code does matrix multiplication of 100 by 100, right? So here it's defining the length of the array. So I, I, I will skip uh, most of this because uh, I don't want to overwhelm you guys. But you can see how the relationship between the code. I, I've given you here if you want to play with the uh, instructions. This is the exact set of instructions in the compiler that you'd want to run once you actually run the code that will produce what I posted on Blackboard. But then what's going to happen is it's eventually going to translate this code to locations in memory where the instructions are going to be. And then if you see these values, these hex values here, that's just hex, re hex representation of the binary instructions themselves. So these values here are the actual instructions that are, I'll get to your question, I think I have, did I get to your question yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Okay. So these instructions here are the binary representation of the code you're about to do on the specific machine that I ran it on. Okay. What's, your, what's your question? Um, so how, how does the compiler work? Is, is that written in assembly or machine language? Um, no, the compiler is actually a whole different program that takes your program and <laughs> compiles it down. There, there's whole courses that you can take on this, but the whole idea is that you have uh, your program, right? And it goes into a compiler, which is often written in a, a language called YACC, Y-A-C-C. And then from there, you're going to get out assembly language. Uh, if, I, if I go a lot slower, it'll probably work better. Yeah, there we go. It doesn't go fast. So you got your program, and you got your compiler. And then a lot of magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> which my compiler teacher in college who was also on my dissertation committee probably wouldn't have liked that I said that but but then you have if you get out the assembly language as the result that's the whole idea that's and I won't get into tokens and abstract syntax trees and all that it goes on inside the compiler but what you need to know is program magic box where there's a compiler and out goes assembly language does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So when you open an EXE file or like Notepad or something, mm -hmm. after it's been compiled, you get like eight feet of just gibberish is actually assembly language. There you go. There we go. That's exactly now. Now you know, and still still can't run it, but now you know. <laughs> Okay, so um, for example, something that I uh, teach towards the when I end the class about uh, exceptions, and uh, I want to see you understand the whole. Basically, the, off the, it's talking about the exception program counter and the save register. But the, those values that come out, those are the values that come out when you get the blue screen of death. So oftentimes people see that and go, I know exactly what that means now, and that should be the like, things like that should be the, the kind of things that you're going like, wait a minute, that explains this on a computer. That explains that means it's starting to make sense. So, okay, computer architecture versus computer organization is 1.20. Computer architecture is system attributes of a computer 
which contribute to its logical execution and are visible to the programmer. Now what I mean by visible to the programmer means that you can put something in code and get a result and you know how it's being done. So if you write, if you have, uh, there's a program called Pico where you can actually write assembly language, or if you're uh, sadistic enough, you can actually write the actual binary representation. Um, that means it's visible. That means you know by doing this set of code that you will get this set, the set result. So the instruction set is an example of computer architecture. Data representation, I.O. mechanisms, you can actually have the code send things to the screen, to the speaker, to the uh, keyboard, to the printer. And memory addressing, meaning that you can write code using arrays that will send things to specific places in memory. Whereas a computer organization, it's physical details of the, of the computer that are transparent to the program. So, for example, hardware implementation. So, let's say you have an arithmetic logic unit, right? An arithmetic logic unit is a, you can put code into the, the data path and it will execute something within the ALU and put output a result. So that's a computer architecture. However, the underlying hardware, you can't manipulate that with code, right? That's organization. So, also control signals, you have the, you have the um, opcode that will send to the controller, but the control signals but themselves you can't manipulate. The memory technology is that you, know, you have a, a memory cache. You can say, I want it to go here, but based on the technology, you can't control how fast it goes, right? You can't do that with code. And another one, gamma use CPU, uh, CPU design, all right. Are examples of organization. Now, I can tell you that the third question on your exam will be to find and differentiate between computer architecture and computer organization and give me three examples of each. I have no problem saying that to you. And here's why. My advisor, Dr. Ranganathan, has uh, a st the student who was before me go went to go at Intel, and he asked that qu exact question. The guy had no idea, and he's like, all right, get out of here. Like they refused to get the heat. That was the first question in the interview. He's supposed to be there for eight hours. They threw him out. You don't want that happening to you, right? So I'm going to ask that you know the difference between computer architecture and computer organization and be able to give examples. Yeah, people can be really weird. <laughs> they flew them out. They paid for his flight in his hotel and just threw them out after one question. No doubt, do you just know how I was able to spot the definitions without looking at the screen? That is because I've had them drilled into my head by my advisor. And I, the ironic thing is I never applied to Intel, so. <laughs> you did your undergrad at South Florida? Yes, okay. I did all three there. Oh, and I have a little spiel here. So notice how I have visible and transparent listed there. I have this whole thing about don't say invisible. Can you see the computer? It, is it invisible to you? So if you write, if you say computer organization is the invisible part of the computer, what does that make you look like? Like a, like a crazy person, right? <laughs> like I see unicorns in computer organizations, you know. <laughs> Transparent is the technical term. So make sure that you don't, like, if you say invisible, you'll lose a lot of credit, so. Okay, what time is it? I have changed the clock, so that way it is the correct time, by the way. Okay, so now I want to give you guys a kind of a brief overview of what this architecture is going to be. <laughs> what did I? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Harry Potter is not driving invisible. Okay, yeah. I forgot. This is true. All true things. 
And does anybody have any, because I know we're kind of going on to what, going in more detail about MIPS, and I know I just threw a lot at you about computer architecture. So if anybody has any questions, I'm, what's that? Check on the, oh, you mean for after class? Okay, so MIPS, I, and I've also on the same place where I posted the uh, that code, I've also actually posted the original paper that was written by Patterson and Hennessy, which is the much smaller version of your textbook. It's like six pages. But what MIPS stands for is microprocessor without interlocked pipe stages. So if you recall, when the last class when I was talking about the tyranny of numbers and they thought that every part had to be connected to every other part. So even though Jack Kilby had gotten rid of this, there's still this idea that every stage within the data path had to be connected to each other through this interlocks. And so what they did was said, we want to get rid of these interlocks and use these pipeline stages instead. So they're breaking up the data path into sections, and they have this section, instruction fetch. I'll be discussing the, those five here in a minute. Instruction fetch. Tell me what the instruction is. And then next clock. Instruction decode. Tell me what part is the opcode. Tell me which part goes to the registers. Tell me which part does breaks it down. Next stage, execute. Send things to the arithmetic logic unit. Stop. Next stage, data memory. Do I need to upload anything to the data memory? Or last stage, am I just going to send it back to the registers? Like that add unit, that add instruction, fetch the add instruction, decode it using the opcode, execute, give me those two variables from the registers, put them in the ALU themselves, give me an output. Stage four, does it need to be sent to the data memory? No, because that sends things back to the registers. This stage right back puts it in the registers themselves. And so the main goal of the design is the, okay, the main goal of MIPS is the design of high performance in the execution of compiled code. So the whole goal is you have some compiled code. We have gone past where your question was. The compiler has already done stuff. Right? And then MIPS is going to break that down and execute it with high performance. And that's how we're able to use this instruction set architecture by having the code down to the ISA and then from the ISA to the hardware. Yes? Uh, in, I want to say computer today, they're getting a little crazy. But and just say the, the like Intel 404 mm -hmm. would a computer like that have one data stream so like once it's broken that any program broken down a signal then you can turn into one stream or one to zero. Okay, so what you've touched on is a problem called multiprocessing. So you have multiple paths going through multiple uh, instructions. CISC, a uh, complex instruction set computer, actually can do multiple instructions at the same time with the same set of ones and zeros. But what happens when you have multiple instructions going through multiple data paths? some of them ex requiring the same registers at the same time. That's going to be section seven that we're going to go in section seven or eight if we get if we get there. But the whole idea is that you have to make you have to do a lot of hazard detection checking. So that kind of becomes a bottleneck on being able to use multiprocessors to be able to improve the performance of compiled code. Is that one of the main differences between front and circular in those buses? Yes. And so the basic philosophy of MIPS. That's why circular is so much better. What's that? That's why circular is so much better. Indeed. You have to do the hazard is when you're hyperthreading the. Exactly. Oh. Exactly right. Okay. Now you're now you're learning the operating system. So I take it you're a computer engineer. Yeah. Okay. That's the reason I know that's because the, only the computer engineers are required to take operating systems. Well, I, just, I, hope, I haven't taken any of the classes. Oh, just, right. The reason I'm saying that's because I hope that the double E's who don't have to take operating systems are just like hyper-threading circular buffers. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so we were just going to go, which since you were up watching seven Harry Potters last night, or your roommates were. Uh, <laughs> I was in my bed listening to the screen for four hours. <laughs> It, it, it might as well it might as well be the same thing as <laughs> right okay so the basic philosophy of MIPS what time is it uh, okay so that is to present an instruction set that is compiler driven encoding of the micro engine thus little or no decoding is required right 
So the whole idea is that once you have the compiler, you've actually broken it down, and you can the only decoding you need to do is take the parts of the binary representation and send it to the control unit, send it to the registers, and so forth. You used, when you had to deal with these interlock pipeline stages, you had to decode every stage every single time, and that significantly reduced uh, the performance of the computer. Okay. Does that make sense? I feel like I put too much in there. So, it was simple both instructions. Um, I want you to cut off 124 here. All of this is not supposed to be part of it. I apologize. Um, the risk architecture is simple in both the instruction set and hardware need to implement that instruction set. Although the misinstruction. Oh yeah, no, cut it off here. Sorry, after one sentence. The rest of this is supposed to be another paragraph. I'll update this in my notes. The risk architecture is simple in both the instruction set and the hardware needed to implement that instruction set. So not only is it trying to reduce the, the, the code, it's compiled down, it uses a small number of instructions, and you're trying to make a small data path to implement all those. You're just using a lot of instructions to get these instructions done. So for example, uh, taking a multiplication and using a bunch of additions to implement it. And in section three, we're going to be going over different uh, multiplication and division algorithms that use that this was done. So the TGO should only be the first sentence. Although MIPS has a simple hardware implementation, the user level instruction set is not as straightforward, and the simplicity of the user level instruction set is secondary to performance goals. Meaning that there are times when, um, for example, there's an instruction called add immediate. And that's like what happens if you have x minus 5. The immediate instruction is the actual number. Now, they're trying to achieve high performance. So you would think, before this, you would think that there would be a subtractor in you, right? You want x minus 5. But by optimizing the compiler, you just perform two's complement and perform subtraction of the instruction. So you only have add immediate instructions in the instruction set. Does anybody not know what two's complement is? Okay, everybody knows that. Good. Okay, this is actually the whole instruction because this is a very important concept about um, data may only be operated in registers and load stores. So repeated use of the registers is a basic block of code to prevent redundant load stores and redundant addressing calculations. Now the whole idea is that registers are your local copy of data. They're fast, you want to use those, and they are volatile, meaning that if you were to shut the computer off, you'd lose that information. So what would you be non-volatile is your data memory. And the whole idea is that once you get that, you're going to be loading it up into the data memory after you perform the high-speed calculations. Does that make sense? This, this allows higher throughput since more operations directly relate to the computation that directly relate to the computation can be performed. So if you remember that example where there were load instructions, you actually calculate the address in data memory, get that information, and then load it into a register, and then you can use it to perform an operation. But if it's already in the register, you can just put it in the ALU, get the operation, store it in the ALU, and be done with it. So it's faster. And a simplified uh, pipeline structure has a fixed number of pipe stages and the same time length. So the whole idea is that you have load, add, let's so you have three types of instructions, we'll go into more detail later, but they take different amounts of time and you use buffers to make it so that way each clock pulse has the same amount of time, therefore eliminating race conditions. Okay, so um, we're going to stop at 126, and I actually already kind of said this out loud, the five stages of the MIPS data path.
where the instruction fetch is get the compiled MIPS binary machine code instruction from the instruction memory and loads it into the data path. Instruction decode decodes the machine instruction and generates the control signals, determines the appropriate registers and memory location, and the necessary operation. So it's taking that binary value, getting the uh, opcode to different registers, potential media instruction, and so forth, and getting that value. Execution performs the operation dictated by the machine instruction. Data memory so it's doing that load and store operation. Let me scroll this up just a little bit. If the operation indicates that some information must be stored in memory, it will be done in this stage. So that's storing it to the slower memory. Otherwise, you don't have to worry about it. And then write back, if you want it right back to the registers, it's done in this stage. Okay. So we did uh, 1.3 and 1.4 on the example questions, right? Okay, so. Your homework that's due next Tuesday is uh, T. I think this one. It's going to be 1.13 through 1.26. And then example questions three and four. There are no other questions here at the one point three and one point four. Yes. Question about what was I mean earlier in your life. Okay. When we were defining those registers as a, we have A equals B plus B and C. We had S one, S two, and S three. B and C, B was S one. Right. Instead of S two. Okay, so we'll be going into that in a lot more detail in section four. Hold on, I gotta Turn off the. Why are you late? Right. So. I was going to send you. Hold up. Stop for a second. I got. I'm turning off the screen. You're going to send me the mail, and then what happened? I was going, but I was standing in line. If I went back, 